Good evening and welcome. My name is Bernhard Meyer and I'm the interim dean for the Faculty of Science. I'm pleased that so many of you have decided to join us for this first presentation in our 2021-22 Gallagher Colloquium series. We are recording today's session and will be posting this video on the Faculty of Science website. I encourage you to check out our website at science.ucalgary.ca for event listings and video updates. As we come together in these times of physical distancing and virtual connections, I like to think about whom I'm sharing the space with now both near and far. We are broadcasting from Calgary, which is located on the traditional territories of the people of the 3D7 region in southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Siksika, the Pikani, and the Kainai First Nations, as well as the Sutina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspa, and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home of the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. The University of Calgary is situated on land adjacent to where the Bow River meets the Elbow River. And the traditional Blackfoot name of this place is Mokinsis, which we now call the city of Calgary. Since 2015, the Department of Geoscience has organized over 30 Gallagher Colloquium Series lectures and has invited speakers to share their passion for science, scientific research, and exploration. We are pleased to offer tonight's lecture online, giving us the opportunity to engage with more attendees from around the globe. I'd like to take a moment to recognize the Gallagher family for making this series possible through their generosity and vision for deep connections between the university and the community. While the Gallagher Colloquium continues to promote public awareness for science and scientific research, we also want to acknowledge the impact this series has on our own students here on campus. Next, I would like to invite Gabby McKinnon to say a few words. Gabby is a fourth year undergraduate student in the Department of Geoscience. She's majoring in geology and is the vice president of social and events for our student-led Rundle Club. Again, thank you all for joining us for this event and enjoy tonight's presentation. Over to you, Gabby. Thank you for that introduction, Dr. Meyer. I'm Gabby, and I'm very excited to have this opportunity to thank the Gallagher family for their continued and generous support of this public lecture series. In my experience as an undergrad student, the Gallagher Colloquium series provides insight into the possibilities in geoscience after graduation, shining a light on the different career paths one can pursue with a geology degree beyond traditional industries. Personally, I feel this series opens students' minds and gives us a chance to think about what we are passionate about, passionate about within the industry and that we are not confined to a specific field. To the Gallagher family, thank you for the generous gift of the Gallagher Colloquium series. Your kind support for this series exposes students like myself to the broader context of theories and techniques we learn in classrooms, labs, and field schools. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of tonight's event. I'm now going to turn it over to Dr. Ben Tudelo to introduce our speaker. Thank you very much, uh, both Bernhard and Gabby, for those fine introductions, and good evening, everyone. I'm Ben Tudelo, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Geoscience and the Faculty of Science, and I'm again the Gallagher Colloquium Series Lead for this year. It's my pleasure to be here this evening and to introduce tonight's speaker, my friend and colleague, Dr. Dan Sugar. Dan is an associate professor of geoscience and director of the environmental science program at the University of Calgary. His main area of expertise is rapid geological change, particularly in alpine environments, but he has also worked on slower phenomena and flatter environments, including sea level change, turbulence and sediment transport in rivers, and ground ice and permafrost. His real love, though, is ice cream, as he proved uh, to me this afternoon by giving me a nice ice cream sandwich, and he makes a lot of it. He serves as a scientific editor for the Journal of Glaciology, is a fellow of the Royal Canadian Geographical Society, and recently was awarded the 2021 Early Career Research Excellence Award from the University of Calgary's Faculty of Science. 
Dan earned a BSc in Physical Geography from Carleton University, an MSc in Physical Geography from the University of Guelph, and a PhD in Earth Sciences from Simon Fraser University. He was a Hakai Mitex postdoctoral fellow at the University of Victoria and an assistant professor at the University of Washington Tacoma prior to joining the University of Calgary. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Dan Sugar, who will discuss mountain hazards cascades in North America and high mountain Asia. Welcome, Dan. Thanks very much for that, uh, Ben. I am going to get right into it here. And I'm gonna start with a, uh, a short video. So this event, this landslide and tsunami that occurred here in Tom Fjord is a huge event. It's one of the largest tsunamis that we have ever seen in modern history. The end of where the tsunami went, it's the limit of inundation there, it was about 176 meters that trimmed the forest on the sides of the sides of the fjord. In many places, 50, 60 meters, 200 feet or so up the valley walls. In at least one place, 180, 185 meters up, so 600 odd feet. Taking that scientific information, putting it through the engineering interpretation, and then being able to provide a product to policymakers, to local emergency managers, that allows them to make decisions when events occur. This is the end goal. I'm very grateful of, of working with people who really know what they're doing out here. Access is at best sketchy. Actually get out here and you can see how big a mountain just collapsed into the fjord. It, it's absolutely surprising. <laughs> So as, uh, as Ben um, in his introduction there said, um, I work on hazards and, and in particular, or at least recently, I've been focusing a little bit on um, what we call cascading hazards or, or sometimes kind of dominoes. Um, and, and so I, I thought I'd start with a, a bit of a definition. And so I, we can think of cascading hazard processes as uh, having some kind of primary trigger like heavy rainfall, a big storm, seismic activity, in other words, a big earthquake, snow melt, something like that followed by a chain or a web of consequences that can cause uh, subsequent uh, hazards or evolving hazards. And so in a recent paper, Kirschbaum and, and, uh, and colleagues um, kind of illustrated several kinds of these hazards cascades that are uh, common in the high mountains. In particular, in this paper, it was about high mountain Asia, but, but these are applicable in <clears throat> many mountain ranges around the world. And these include uh, landslides that dam rivers, uh, outburst floods, uh, et cetera. And so, Following the Gorkha earthquake in Nepal in, in 2015, there were thousands of landslides triggered across, um, across uh, the Himalaya, mostly in Nepal, and about 20 of them in the upper Marshiandi Valley. Um, these were both co-seismic, in other words, triggered by the earthquake itself, as well as post-seismic, so sort of shook and loose by the earthquake, but didn't actually fail for maybe a couple of days or a week. Uh, afterwards. And so about 20 of these collapsed into the uh, into the Marshiandi River. One of them was was quite large, about a kilometer long, or, or I guess wide across the or along the river. And you can see that in this photograph on the right here, here's the landslide. And so this is impounded uh, a lake 
that raised concerns about uh, an outburst flood in the coming weeks as the area entered the monsoon season. So, you know, if you lived a couple kilometers downstream of here, you know, the earthquake happened, um, you survived the earthquake, but then a month later, there's a giant flood um, because this, this lake uh, burst. Other examples of um, hazard cascades in the, in the high mountains might include mass wasting into a lake. So in other words, a, a landslide into a lake or a glacier that calves, a big chunk of it falls off into the lake, and then it would burst through its dam and create a flood. In the case of glacial lakes, like we have lots of in Western North America, uh, we call it a glacial lake outburst flood or a GLOF, G-L-O-F. And what really first got me interested in these kind of hazards cascades was, uh, was this quote from Ralph uh, Tarr in 1910. The vigorous earthquakes of September 1899 shook down such great avalanches of snow, ice, and rock so as to necessitate a wave of advance that swept through the glaciers. And this is, you know, beautifully romantic language as was, was quite common, you know, in, in uh, reports and, and um, travel logs and, and scientific papers from 100 years ago. Uh, but basically what he was, was saying was, uh, there were a series of earthquakes at the, the turn of the century that uh, released avalanches of, uh, of rock and snow, and those actually caused some glaciers to advance catastrophically, what we might today call a, a glacier surge. And so there's been a little bit of anecdotal evidence in the hundred odd years since then um, to, to maybe back this up. So in the, the middle photograph here, uh, apologies for, for it being a little bit... Uh, a little bit dark to see, but this is Bwaltar Glacier in uh, the Pakistan Karakoram. This glacier had three big rock avalanches or, or giant landslides in 1986, and then the glacier surged a few months later. So in other words, it, um, the surface velocity accelerated and the terminus advanced a couple kilometers. The cover of Science Magazine here in 2003, this is McGinnis Glacier in the Alaska Range in Central Alaska. It had one big landslide onto this branch of the glacier in the 2002 Denali earthquake. And then soon thereafter, this branch surged. This branch here, which, which didn't get a, a landslide on it, didn't surge. And so these are you know, compelling bits of circ circumstantial evidence. Um, and it, it turns out that the theory, this sort of so-called earthquake advance theory of tar, it may be, uh, we, we might say is really not correct most of the time, but maybe in certain circumstances, if the winds are blowing just right, then maybe it can happen. This is a pretty big landslide in Alaska. This is on Lamplu Glacier in Glacier National Park. Uh, landslide came from this, uh, this slope here and spread out over the glacier. This is a, a gigantic uh, area that's covered here, but it didn't cause a surge. Okay, so why am I showing this, this glacier to you? Um, well, this one would have been a much bigger deal if the landslide had occurred just a little bit closer to the south of the frame. And that's because Lamplu is a tidewater glacier. And so if this had happened, uh, if this landslide had come down off of this slope, say, or, or this one here and entered the fjord, especially when there was a cruise ship holding several thousand people there, this would have turned into a major disaster rather than just a landslide of, of sort of geological interest. This is pretty similar to actually what happened not too far up the coast at Latuya Bay in Alaska, uh, except there it was fishing boats that were in the, the water and not cruise ships. And so Latuya Bay is the site of the largest tsunami ever recorded on Earth, over 500 meters high, or 600 meters high, about 1,700 feet. This is a quote here. There were three fishing boats in the, uh, in the bay at the time. And so uh, Bill Swanson saw the wave engulf the Sunmore, one of the other boats, as it tried to escape. The wave, estimated to be approximately 80 feet high at the time, hit, hit his boat and carried it over the spit, dumping, dumping it stern first into the ocean. So that's this spit here. We went way over the trees and I looked down on rocks as big as an ordinary house as we crossed the spit. We were way above them. It felt like we were in a tin can and somebody was shaking it. So, you know, just imagine, you know, the videos that we've seen of tsunamis in uh, the Indian Ocean and th this kind of thing. And these would absolutely dwarf, these landslide generated tsunamis absolutely dwarf those um, earthquake trigger tsunamis that, uh, that we've seen lots of news video of. This uh, animation on the right-hand side here, this is a simulation of a landslide triggered tsunami uh, that was shown in the, the documentary trailer that I showed you right at the beginning. This is a photograph of it here. Uh, came down from this slope here, hit the glacier, but most of it went into the fjord. And even, um, even though this one produced one of the largest tsunamis ever recorded on Earth, about 190 meters high vertically, 
Um, nobody was killed. In fact, um, very few people even noticed uh, that this tsunami had occurred. If it had occurred in, in another glaciated fjord in Alaska or during the summer where there may have been cruise ships in the area, uh, again, it may have been a, a very, very different story indeed. So today I'd like you to take, take you to two different uh, locations, um, one in the mountains of Western Canada and, and BC and, and one in the Himalaya of High Mountain Asia. Um, both of these combine really high topographic relief, steep glacially carved terrain, lots and lots of water, uh, lots of available sediment. And importantly, and, and is gonna, as I hope you'll see and agree with, both are, are probably two of the most data rich geohazard events um, that have ever occurred on earth. Um, and also at both, social media played a, a pretty important role in deciphering the sequence of events, especially in the minutes to days to hours, uh, minutes to hours to days uh, afterwards. So first, let's, uh, let's head to coastal BC. So Butte Inlet is circled here. This is Vancouver Island here. Uh, Butte Inlet is one of the really large fjords that indents the coastline of, of Western North America. And it's fed by two big rivers, the Hamathco, which comes in from the, uh, from the north, that would be at this one here, here, and the Southgate River. Um, and each of these are, are glacier fed in turn. One of the tributaries of Southgate is uh, Elliott Creek, which is gonna be the focus of, uh, of at least part of our discussion today. So that's this one here, joins Southgate, and then it dumps into, uh, into Tidewater at, at Butte Inlet. So in early December of uh, 2020, a helicopter pilot, Bastian Fleury, uh, noticed a lot of logs floating in Butte Inlet, uh, a lot more than, than would be normal. And so he flew up, the, um, flew up the valley and took some pretty spectacular helicopter footage that was picked up by, um, by uh, several news agencies. But at that point, it wasn't really particularly well understood what had happened. Some, some very large event had happened, but we didn't really know exactly what it was. A few days later, Brent Ward, who's a prof at Simon Fraser University, uh, tweeted this. It's been a glacial lake outburst flood, Elliott Creek, just east of the head of Butte Inlet, thanks to Interfor, forestry company, uh, for forwarding the images. Details are sparse, but appears part of the glacier failed and hit the lake. And so this photograph here, a helicopter photo, is, is the same um, as you'll see here. I'll show you more images of this later. And then this is basically the same thing, but looking in the opposite direction. So you're looking up an alluvial fan here into, uh, into the valley. But actually, it turns out that the landslide was discovered by seismologist Yaron Ekstrom at, uh, at his desk in New York. Um, and so this is an email from Yaron to, to my colleague Martin Gertzma at the um, BC Forestry um, Ministry of Forests. And I, I wanted to underline a few things. But he's basically saying his uh, seismic conversion technique keeps detecting these landslide events all over the world. There's a detection in BC that he wants to, uh, wants to know a little bit more about. And so he provides the coordinates here, the timing of it. Um, note the date. So this was December 1st, but it occurred on uh, November 28th. And then the other thing to, to keep in mind here is that I was using a, the global network of seismometers, nothing local, in fact, nothing in British Columbia at all. And so his location estimate may have been not quite as accurate as, uh, as he would have, would have liked. So this is the location that um, Yaron's a seismic conversion placed the landslide, and this is the location of the landslide itself. And so this is actually quite a common thing with um, Yaron, he'll, he'll send these, uh, these uh, detections to Martin and myself and, and other colleagues, and then we go around in satellite imagery and try to find, uh, try to find the event and, and learn a little bit about it. So let's dive into this event, see a little bit what, uh, what actually happened. So what you're looking at here is a um, perspective view on a DEM hillshade. So this is basically just the shadows in the, that, that are caused by the terrain. So this is sort of like a Google Earth kind of view, except with LiDAR imagery. So extremely high resolution topographic data. You're looking up. So this is Southgate here, Southgate River, the big one, and then Elliott Creek, the much smaller one. This is the lake at the head of the creek, and the landslide is going to come from down here. And then all of the smooth stuff up here at the top, this is all... Um, this is a, these are all uh, ice fields and then some, some little outlet glaciers here. So there's a little quote, bit of confusion about whether there may have been a small earthquake immediately prior, but nevertheless, what we have is we've got an initial landslide that came off the slope into the lake. That triggered a tsunami, which then triggered a glacial lake outburst flood, which ran down Elliott Creek, 
depositing a whole bunch of material into Southgate River uh, Valley itself. And then the flood continued down towards um, to, uh, down Southgate River towards Butte Inlet. And so we'll talk about what happened when the flood reached uh, tidewater in a few minutes. <clears throat> so the initial landslide was on the order of about 18 million cubic meters, which, you know, if you're not used to thinking in volumes of millions of cubic meters, you take my word for it that that's pretty big. Uh, descended about a kilometer vertically, and it deposited about half the half of that volume, half of the 18 million, um, in a big pile at the base of the uh, base of the slope. And so that this uh, photograph here, we're looking up the valley. The landslide came from up here somewhere, and then all of these um, really angular blocks. This is um, uh, half, roughly half of the uh, of the landslide material itself. Now, a landslide can only trigger a tsunami if there's liquid water at the base of the slope for it to produce a, a wave. And so what you can see here is that over the last few decades, um, Elliott Lake, as we're calling it, which is the, the, blue, um, the blue data and the blue outline here, has grown dramatically from about 0.15 square kilometers in the early 80s to about 0.6 square kilometers in, uh, in, in, in recent years. And a nearby lake, this one here, uh, which is just used as a reference, this was essentially attached to its glacier in, in 1953, which is when this air photo was from, and it hasn't really changed. The lake hasn't changed much since. Much since. In fact, it's, it's maybe decreased in size just a tiny bit, all the while the glacier is, is way back here. So you're looking at the background image from 1953. Here's the lake extent in 1953, and the blue dash line represents what the lake would look like today or, or you know, a, year, um, a year ago. So that's the, the blue dash line. So in other words, if the landslide, the exact same landslide had occurred in, in the 80s or the 70s or the 60s or the 50s from the same location, it's unlikely that it would have amounted to very much at all. It's unlikely it would have entered the lake because the lake was way down here. But as, um, as, as the glacier has retreated and the lake has grown, we've essentially rearranged the landscape elements to change the hazards equation. And so, in other words, it's only because the lake has grown that the landslide turned into a hazards cascade that then traveled 100 kilometers down the valley. So let's head back up to the, uh, let's head back up to the lake. We can see actually, so this is a, another helicopter photo. The previous one was from over here, kind of looking in this direction. This one, we can see a whole bunch of stuff in the lake. So this is all actually new landslide debris probably much of the remaining nine to 10 million cubic meters of the landslide itself. Um, the, the, the tsunami that was generated had a peak run up of something like 120 meters above sea level, which is an enormous height for such a small lake. Um, and there was remarkably little erosion of the, the dam of the lake itself. So, so right about where sort of near where my X is here, there's very little erosion of the dam. And that, that leads me to believe, or at least to wonder if the dam was actually bedrock with maybe only a very thin layer of moraine, um, so not a classic moraine dam like we saw uh, in Nostatuco Lake in one of those one of the first slides. Anyway, after the tsunami and the, the outburst flood, uh, the lake level was was nearly brimful. It was pretty much you know full to the top, and that's a, kind of strange. You know, if you think of all this water that that got sloshed out of the the lake, but it's it's explained by a nearly identical volume of rock that has entered the lake. Um, then water exiting the lake. All right, so let's move downstream a little bit. <clears throat> so in Elliott Creek itself, you see we've got areas of, of some areas of kind of light blue here, which is aggradation or, or a deposition of sediment. But mostly we've got erosion, which is all the, the red material, um, often on the order of 20 to 40 meters vertically. So a pretty substantial amount of vertical down cutting into, um, into the, the the sediment that comprised the, the bed of Elliott Creek. Um, the total erosion throughout the entire path of Elliott Creek here from this distance here, is on the order of about 8 million cubic meters. So let me, let me go back. So we've got 18 million cubic meters, half of it deposited above the lake, probably about half of it deposited in the lake. So in other words, no landslide material or very little of it actually made it past this point. We now have a new 8 million cubic meters of sediment that have been eroded from the creek, as you can see in this photograph here, that then need to go somewhere downstream. So these are two photos of the same fan that uh, that helicopter pilot, uh, Fleury, um, posted uh, or, or was used by, by CBC News there. 
Um, and so this is the confluence of Elliott Creek and Southgate River. And in my opinion, this is where things get pretty interesting geomorphologically speaking. And so where Elliott Creek leaves the pretty narrow confines of uh, the valley and enters the Southgate Valley, which is much, much broader, we see the massive deposit of sediment, about 4 million cubic meters. That's all this blue stuff here and built a very steep alluvial fan over top an existing but less steep alluvial fan surface. And so we've got roughly 4 million cubic meters of deposition there. And then below that in the Southgate River, not, not a whole lot going on. Uh, I, I mean, lots of things going on, but not a whole lot of net uh, geomorphic change. This debris uh, did act to dam the Southgate for a little bit. So there was some ponding upstream, but um, eventually that water Found a, found a way through. And what I thought was really interesting here is on the fan surface, you can see in, in actually both of these photos, this very sharp delineation between the much coarser bouldery material closer to the apex of the fan and this much finer grained material here. And it's to me, it's striking just how sharp that boundary is. And this suggests a, a very rapid deceleration in flow as the flow expanded out of the Elliott Creek Valley. So this is some preliminary uh, modeling by Jonathan Karavik at the University of Leeds. And it shows, you know, as the, the velocity and the, the Froud number, um, as the flow gets out of Elliott Creek into Southgate, you see a really, really rapid drop in both, um, both velocity and Froud number. And so this sort of matches the, uh, the field observations that we have. All right, let's, uh, let's head downstream a little bit and go underwater. But before we do that, before we look at Butte Inlet itself, I should note that a lot has been written about um, turbidity currents in Butte Inlet, including by uh, people in the audience. This is one of Sophie Hage's papers, who's a postdoc here at uh, the University of Calgary. Um, Butte Inlet is probably the site uh, with the most detailed repeat bathymetric um, uh, the mapping campaign of an active submarine canyon anywhere on Earth. We've got high resolution, uh, what are called multi-beam surveys, in many years, sometimes even twice a year since 2008. So just a tremendous um, uh, amount of, of pre-event information to, to draw on. We know that the Hamathka River, so not, not the one that we're talking about now, but the one on the other side of the fjord, provides usually about 80% of the freshwater input into Butte Inlet and Southgate River about 15%. And the system sees um, something like 10 turbidity currents a year, typically, and these are driven often by high discharge in the rivers from snow and glacier melt. In other words, um, very rarely do we see these in, uh, in the late fall. So this is a, a paper now, now pretty old, um, and each of these little funny symbols here represents a turbidity current over their, their measurement uh, year, and you see this distinct gap in late, uh, late fall uh, and winter where no turbidity currents are recorded. And keep in mind, um, this one that we're talking about was November 28th, so uh, I would put it you know, somewhere, somewhere like here. And in addition, most of the turbidity currents in, in Butte Inlet travel not much further than about 25 kilometers down, uh, down the fjord. So the, the Hakai Institute, which is a, a scientific organization on the West Coast, they've been doing oceanographic surveys in Butte Inlet, as well as other uh, fjords on, uh, on our coast. Um, monthly for the past several years. And these are turbidity measurements from about a month before the event, uh, just coincidentally. And so what we've got here is um, these are distance from head of the head of the fjord. So the, you know, the fjord head is up here somewhere. So now we're going down fjord towards open ocean over a, a distance of about 70 odd uh, kilometers. You can see about a month before um, the, uh, the, the big event, not much of anything is really going on. There's, Slightly higher turbidity at the head of the fjord, not particularly, uh, not not particularly surprising. So the next Hakai cruise was actually a few days after the event. Um, they didn't know about the the landslide and, and outburst flood at the time, but they actually did notice um, that there were a lot more logs floating in the fjord than uh, than normal. Now. This plot here, so this is from November, uh, December 2nd, so just a few days, four, five, six days after the uh, outburst flood and turbidity current event, and you can see that turbidity measurements just go through the roof, uh, relatively speaking, and actually are elevated for on the order of 70 kilometers um, down fjord, which is, which is pretty astonishing. Now, keep in mind that this, this middle panel is like nearly a week after the event, and so what we're likely seeing here is 
the very fine grained fraction settling out of suspension, perhaps some additional material that's kind of been sloughing off the, the, the delta front, but, but not the actual turbidity current itself, but rather sort of the, the tail end of it, just the almost like the shadow of the turbidity current. So in other words, the, the Hakai cruise on December 2nd just happened to be in exactly the right place in exactly the right time in order to collect these data, which suggested a very large, potentially very important turbidity current had taken place. This uh, later one here with unfortunately a few data gaps, this was from a couple of weeks later, uh, you know, after they, they noticed these data here and, and basically back to normal. So this was really a, um, a pretty uh, fortuitous data capture. So, so what actually happened on, uh, on the ocean floor, on, on the ground, so to speak? So what you're seeing here are some plots um, produced by, uh, by my postdoc, Mike Tilston, as a series of cross sections from surveys from 2016 to the present. And we're showing both Hamathgo and Southgate. So this is the Hamathgo here. Here's the Southgate. So these are underwater data now. And then this is the main branch. So all of the Hamathgo data are labeled HB. All of the Southgate data are labeled SB. And then from this point on, they're labeled MB for, for main branch. And so the gray envelopes that you can see here are uh, basically represent the total range of bed elevations along each of these cross sections um, at the, uh, for, for each of the years. And so each color um, of these, these lines here represents a different year, dark brown being the survey from January 2021, so just a, a six weeks, two months after the turbidity current itself. And so what's immediately obvious here is that the November 2020 turbidity current did far more geomorphic work than, uh, so in other words, erosion and deposition than any other turbidity current has in the previous five years or so. And if previous data are anything to go by, this system sees about 10 a year. So maybe you know, more powerful than the previous 50 uh, turbidity currents at least. And so above the confluence with Hamathco, uh, the Southgate branch um, was modified mostly by widening of the channel. You can see here this brown line and, and look at the, the scale here. So this is hundred meters. So, you know, widening on the order of four, probably 30, 40 meters here at this point. Um, but in some places, pretty substantial deposition occurred as well. So this is on the order of about 15, maybe 20 meters um, at, uh, at, the, at the Thal Lake. In the Hamathco branch, we actually also see pretty substantial change, which was a little bit surprising. We see pretty substantial deposition, um, and this is due to bifurcation of the flow. So the, the turbidity current came down this channel here. Most of it went down main branch, you know, downhill, but certainly some of the, uh, some of the water and sediment went up the Hamathco channel and deposited in, uh, in the bed there. And so below the confluence then, we see a lot of deposition on the valley floor for about two kilometers from, from the confluence point. But this is probably at least compensated by erosion of the valley walls. So in other words, we're seeing a, a flattening of the channel, but also a broadening of the channel. And so at first glance, this might seem a little bit surprising. You, you know, one might assume that such a powerful flow would incise through the previous channel floor. In other words, would downcut vertically through older sediments. But we think that this turbidity current was, was quite unique. It was very large, but it was also carrying a massive amount of sediment, so much more fine-grained sediment than is normal, that it behaved quite differently from sort of a normal turbidity current. So we think that in this event, uh, the 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 helical flows that were produced around this bend here were actually reversed from normal, um, normal circulation that we might see in a river or, or a, a kind of a, a smaller turbidity current. Um, and although this work is, is ongoing, or I should say this work is ongoing, we've got a, another survey uh, hopefully planned there in a couple of weeks from now um, to see whether these, these new deposits, which are, are quite substantial, have, have begun to get reworked in the last, uh, last six or seven months. Okay, let's switch gears a little bit. Let's, let's move over to um, High Mountain Asia. So on the morning of February 7th of uh, this year, my colleague Rakesh Bambri uh, tweeted this video from um, Indian journalist Kaviru Padhai of this pretty impressive flood. Um, and the initial speculation was that it was due to a glacial lake outburst flood or GLOF. So we're going to watch a little bit of the video here or, or, or an almost identical video. Hey, 
Keep your eyes on the bottom half. So I saw this video at um, 7.35 a.m. my time, and I asked Rakesh you know, to send me some coordinates so I could, I could dig in a little bit. Uh, so a few minutes later, uh, Rakesh sent me the coordinates, um, but at that time in the morning, 7.40 in the morning or so, there wasn't yet any satellite imagery that was available for me to, uh, to look at. Um, I, my initial speculation as well was that it was a glacial lake outburst flood. Um, but, you know, just in looking in Google Earth, I actually didn't see many lakes that could have burst that were, were upstream of, uh, of this area. But sometimes you don't need a big lake to make a big flood. So by 8.15 a.m., you can see on the, the bottom here, uh, Planet Labs, which is a, a CubeSat company in San Francisco, um, they'd uploaded a couple of images that showed something that I initially interpreted, interpreted as emanating from a small valley glacier, um, which so right here, but unfortunately, the scene didn't actually cover the area that I thought uh, was, was the, the culprit, so to speak. I saw this, this plume of dust in the air here, and that really reminded me of the, of the dust and that, the, the, um, the moisture in the air from the, the, the videos that, that we just watched. But I couldn't watch any, or I couldn't see any obvious glacial lakes. Um, but as I said, the, the scene didn't cover the glacier itself, and so it was a bit of a, a mystery, at least at this point in the, uh, in the morning. So 11 minutes later, um, I realized that the dust actually wasn't coming from that glacier just out of the frame but was actually coming from a really steep slope just to the west. So actually, if you trace this dust, it actually comes from just right here, just barely, barely in the frame. And so that's um, right, uh, right here. And uh, this, this we're, we're looking vertically now down at this one here. So here is this dust emanating from this sort of dark patch. But half an hour later, there was another new satellite acquisition from Planet, uh, which confirmed certainly in my mind that this was actually a landslide, not um, nothing to do with the glacier below, not to, nothing to do with a glacial lake outburst flood, as was being reported, um, you know, widely on on social media. And so this event at at Chamoli, as it became known, became international news not because it was confusing scientifically, um, but rather because it destroyed two hydropower plants uh, and resulted in, in about 200 people dead or missing. Most of those were in the Tapovan hydropower plant, which is pictured here, or, or the, the remains of it are pictured here. And most of those were workers at the plant. It was under construction at the time. So let's, uh, let's look at the source here and, and, and look at what, what happened. So here we've got a series of images of the source region showing the development of this pretty big crack that you can see in these three images here. This crack actually eventually became the headscarp of the, the landslide. The landslide was uh, on the order of 27 million cubic meters. So recall the butte inlet one was about 18 million cubic meters. So this is, you know, uh, similar order of magnitude, but uh, or same order of magnitude, but but uh, but quite a bit bigger. Um, and about 80% of that 27 million was rock, and the remaining 20% was glacier ice from this very steep, what we call a hanging glacier excuse me, that was plastered, essentially plastered on top of the, of the bedrock uh, slope. And so our interpretations of the, of the cascade, this hazardous cascade, are pretty well captured in this, this simulation by Martin Regili from the University of Graz in Austria. And so the initial failure dropped um, almost two kilometers to the Rontigad Valley below, and, and much of the ice that was contained was melted during that uh, fall, and then the subsequent flow along the Rontigad Valley. I'm going to pause it right there. Um, so the flow super elevated around the bends like a bobsled, um, eventually reaching the confluence with the Rushiganga River, which is which is right here where I've where I paused the video, and it slammed into the opposite bank and deposited a, a, a large pile of sediment. So some of those deposits dammed the Rushiganga, which is this one here, um, and and, and uh, built a lake. I'll show you that in a in a minute. And the flow at this point became much more fluid, uh, partly by um, melting of all of that uh, of all of that ice 
um, as well as the deposition of the sediment. And this is where we think it transitioned to a debris flow. So that's right about this point here in, uh, in this little schematic. And so the flow then continued down the valley, eventually reaching the confluence of the Dawali Ganga, and then destroying, uh, or, or just prior to that, destroying hydropower plants at Rainy, um, and eventually at the Tapovan hydropower plant a little bit downstream, which is the photo that I showed you a minute ago. And so although this modeling is, it was just preliminary, um, it really very uh, impressively matched the geomorphic evidence that we saw in, um, in very high resolution satellite imagery, but also independent estimates of discharge and velocity from eyewitness videos uh, that were posted to Twitter and, and YouTube and Facebook, et cetera. So this is a, a hill shaded DEM um, of, uh, of the, the main valleys that we're interested in here. The source zone is at the top, that's this little inverted triangle, um, and the stars are the, the two hydropower plants, the uh, Rainy plant or the Rishiganga plant and the, the Tapovan plant down here. As we saw in the video, um, the mass descended the, the Rontigad Valley here, um, the two kilometer drop, this part here, but what we can't see as easily in those videos are the details of the trajectory around and over the topography, which was, I think, actually incredible. And so as the flow descended, so here is the landslide scar, it came down here, rode up the valley wall, came down again, and super elevated around this, um, this bend here, rose up to an elevation of 220 meters above the, the local valley floor. So we're looking at the left-hand photo here. Um, and at this point, some of the material actually went airborne over this ridge. By this point, it was probably quite wet due to melting of the, of the glacier ice and slammed uh, or splashed into the valley um, below. You can actually um, see these, these ridges in the DEM right, uh, right here. And so these muddy deposits are probably quite similar to what had, has been mapped at the Frank slide in southern Alberta by uh, Cruden and Hunger in 86, but and even prior to that by McConnell and Brock in 1904, who visited the Frank slide um, very, very soon after it, uh, after it happened. And so on this ridge where this muddy debris went airborne, just about at the top of, uh, of the ridge there, a boulder 13 meters in diameter was deposited by the advancing flow, but didn't have enough energy to go, to go airborne there. In the right-hand photo, the, the blue lines here, these are the trim lines of um, the erosional trim lines that produced by the mass as it traveled down the, down the, the valley. And the, the height of these is, is sometimes 50 meters above, uh, above the valley, valley floor. So it's important to remember here that in the, in the proximal area, like way up near the slope uh, that failed, the ice contained in the mass was likely only partially melted. And as it traveled downstream, more and more uh, of that mass um, of ice was converted to water. And so in other words, it was much drier here than it was down here or further downstream. <coughs> so the flow is moving now down the Runti Gad and gets to the confluence of the Rishiganga here. <clears throat> converting potential energy to kinetic energy and melting any of that remaining, any remaining ice from that initial 5 million or so cubic meters that remained solid. And so a little bit further down valley at the confluence of these two, um, the flow deposited something like 8 million cubic meters of material uh, right, around, uh, right around here, both of rock as well as ice. Part of that um, was where the, the flow took this really sharp bend and so material essentially decelerated and, uh, and fell out um, essentially fell out of suspension. Um, but a lot of it was deposited at the confluence itself. But wherever it was deposited here, one of the impacts of that was that you uh, change the rheology of the flow, effectively diluting it into a much wetter debris flow from a much drier rock avalanche um, up valley. And so these panels here, H and I, are cross sections uh, at the confluence itself, and then J is just downstream of that. And we can see pretty substantial deposition, um, 40 meters uh, or so in the valley at, um, at, at the Rishiganga confluence. And this is what created the dam behind which the Rishiganga um, built a lake in the, in the days afterwards. So here is a, a ground photo and a helicopter photo from, uh, from that lake. Um, the Indian military tried to drain the lake. They sent divers into it, did all sorts of things. They installed an early warning system in case it were to burst catastrophically. Eventually, the lake did drain, um, or, or at least mostly drained, um, by, I understand, uh, natural means, which was good for, the, for people that remained downstream. So one of the things that really amazed me about this event was 
there was the seeming lack of deposition. Yeah, we've got, you know, 8 million cubic meters here, a million cubic meters there. Um, but this is, this is really a, a pretty small fraction of the initial 27 million cubic meters that failed, plus whatever was scoured during the event as it traveled down, down the valleys. And so this is a sentinel image of um, the Srinagar um, hydropower reservoir about 150 kilometers downstream. And by the time that this image was taken on February 8th, so one day after the event, the debris had already reached the up end, upper end of the re reservoir, somewhere around here. And soon, a couple of days later, the reservoir was completely filled with, with uh, turbid water. It wasn't completely filled with sediment, but the water in it was, was extremely turbid. And we can actually track that plume of very sediment-rich water quite a ways downstream. Um, within about two and a half weeks, the plume was, was easily visible 900, excuse me, 900 kilometers uh, from the source, way down on the Ganges. On the right here, this is a screen grab from Facebook. Um, or from a video from, uh, posted on Facebook showing the amazing contrast in um, sediment-rich water coming from the landslide. So that's down the Alaknanda River here, um, meeting with the, the uh, um, uh, Bagi, Bagirati River. And at this point, the river becomes, uh, becomes the Ganges. But just a, an absolutely amazing contrast in, um, in, in turbidity here. And so I think this chain of events at Chamoli is, is going to have important repercussions for many, many years to come, even quite far downstream of the, uh, of the source. And so sedimentary infilling of reservoirs and erosion of turbine blades on the hydropower plants themselves are, are two, I think, pretty important uh, impacts. Okay, so the November 28th um, rock avalanche in Butte Inlet was certainly one of the most complicated mountain hazards uh, mountain hazard cascades that I know of anywhere in the world. And uh, we've got an incredible, unprecedented volume of high quality data, both before the event and after the event. But questions remain about why it actually happened. And so, you know, one, one question that comes to mind is, well, did, did, was there permafrost and did that thaw? It was possible that that played a role, but probably unlikely. This is relatively low elevation and fairly coastal, so that it's unlikely there was much permafrost in, uh, in the mountains at these elevations. What about glacier debuttressing? This is where glaciers thin and pull back and basically remove support from steep uh, valley walls. I think that's certainly a, a contributing cause, especially since the Little Ice Age. So when, when the glacier was, was out to here, um, providing a lot more support to this valley, and over the last 150 years or so, it's been retreating, removing support. So glacier debuttressing is almost certainly a, a cause of the event, probably not a trigger. Maybe what about abnormal weather? Well. I didn't get into it, but there was a pretty significant um, storm, a rainstorm, uh, immediately prior to the event. The Hamathka River, so the one on the other side, is gauged, and uh, we see a pretty big spike in discharge right before um, the event occurred. And so it's likely that um, a lot of water contributed to the failure of the bedrock slope here. What about seismic activity? Unlikely to have been triggered by, a, by a, a, an earthquake. We just don't see anything substantial um, immediately prior, maybe some very, very small things, um, but nothing, no, no smoking gun, so to speak. What about Chamoli? So the, the February 7th uh, rock and ice avalanche at Chamoli was, was a, a massive event as well, with an unusually large uh, fall height of, of two kilometers of, of essentially free fall that resulted in a disaster um, due to the, the incredible mobility that, it, that the, the flow had, but also, and critically, the, the presence of downstream infrastructure and, uh, and people. And so I think the question that is on a lot of people's minds, um, or, or was on a lot of people's minds, was whether there was some sort of climate, uh, climate link. And so the same or similar questions um, can be presented. You know, what about permafrost? Well, the source zone here is at something like 5,500 meters. Um, which is about a kilometer above the limit of permafrost or, or the assumed limit of permafrost in these mountains. And so, you know, we don't have a lot of data on permafrost and ground temperatures in the area. And so it's possible, but not a, not a, not a smoking gun. Glacier debuttressing, you know, a glacier was involved, that little valley, the, uh, sorry, the, the hanging glacier that was plastered to the side here, but glacier debuttressing is not really a big deal. This was, this glacier is, is you know, two kilometers down the valley, hasn't been affecting the slope, is certainly not, uh, not recently. Abnormal weather, maybe. <coughs> um, we don't have 
fantastic weather records from, from the immediate vicinity, but there was a warmer than normal weather in the months preceding the, um, the, the collapse, which maybe that allowed some additional freeze thaw weathering to occur. Remember that was that big crack behind. And then we also had snowstorms in the couple of days before the, the failure, and then an abrupt rise in temperature with an inversion, so warmer at higher temperatures um, than, than at lower temperatures, but the data are, are very sparse and so uh, kind of difficult to, to really get a firm handle on. And then lastly, and I think this one is really important, is the involvement of this, this so-called crack. So the, the, the crack that eventually made the, uh, the head scarp of the landslide here, this was 550 meters wide, um, 800 meters or, or 550 meters long, 80 meters or so wide, um, a big gaping hole that could allow any water over the last few years to get in and, um, and enhance any fractures in the underlying uh, bedrock. So I think that probably played a big role. All right, last few minutes. I wanna circle back to coastal BC. So this is a, uh, a satellite image, very high resolution satellite image from uh, Planet Labs again of Canoe Glacier. And so this is a, a pretty big landslide, 6 million cubic meters, about a third the size of the Butte Inlet one. And this occurred on Canada Day of this year. And, and th those of you that uh, remember what early July was like, um, probably remember the heat dome that was certainly here. And, and so, you know, okay, big landslide occurred on the glacier, you know, who cares? Didn't trigger a tsunami, didn't, um, you know, wipe out a, a pipeline or anything like that. Why am I showing you this? Well, if we zoom out a little bit. Here's the landslide down here. If the landslide had traveled just a little bit farther, it would have entered this lake here, which could have triggered a tsunami easily and an outburst flood, just like a butte inlet. Except here, this is actually another lake downstream. And so this could have, could have triggered basically a, a domino of outburst floods, which would be, uh, which could be quite, a, quite spectacular geophysically speaking. Um, but importantly, there's, there's pretty important infrastructure here. So what I've got circled here is, the, is an airstrip and a staging area for a mine, which is up here. This is the Bruce Jack mine. Um, and so the, you see the airstrip is here, and then there's a road, haul road, that actually goes on top of the Nipple Glacier here, all the way up to the mine um, itself. Now, the mine owners don't seem to think that there's an issue here. This is an article in the Taiyi um, uh, in uh, uh, a month or so ago, six weeks ago or so, and a spokesperson says, we're aware of the landslide. It's really of no consequence to us. It's quite far from any infrastructure in the mine itself. Our entire infrastructure and mindset was designed around where there is no potential geological or geophysical risk of any kind. And it's something that we take into consideration and monitor. So the mine owners don't seem to think that this is a big deal. And I'm not gonna say anything else about this, except that it's pretty rare, I think, in the mountains to have zero risk of a geophysical disaster. So let's bring this a little closer to home. Um, in the Rockies, we have uh, lots of steep slopes, lots of lakes, lots of infrastructure. Landslides seem to be a little bit less on the radar of, of academics as well as government authorities, um, certainly than in, in coastal British Columbia. And so I, I think we really need to be reevaluating the hazards posed by these very steep slopes, especially in the context of climate change, and doubly especially when they're above things like lakes where there are a lot of people. So I'd like to close with this. So this is the, uh, the foreword from the very first issue of the journal Glaciology. And Swedish glaciologist Alman said, uh, as science becomes more and more specialized, each branch comes to depend more and more on collaboration with others. And it seems to me that this sentiment has come full circle. This, is, this was from 1947. Um, collaboration is certainly one of the, the big buzzwords in science today. And I think it's especially important um, in situations such as what I've described today, where we're looking at a huge variety of impacts and different kinds of systems. And with that, um, on that note, I really need to thank my many, many dozens of friends and collaborators at dozens of institutions around the world with, with whom I've been fortunate enough to work with on um, these and, and other projects over the years. And so with that, I will thank you. Thank you very much, Dan, uh, for sharing your research with us this evening. I think to me, uh, one of the most awe-inspiring uh, things that your talk has demonstrated to me is the rapidly acquired and rapid availability of satellite images of these places. Can you just quickly chat through the organizations that are generating these images and the accessibility of these images to the general public and also what is their actual intention in acquiring these images? Oh yeah, sure. 
Um, yeah, absolutely. We've had a, an absolute revolution in Earth observation in the last, uh, I'd say, probably 15 years. Um, Landsat, which is uh, a constellation of satellites run by the US government, has been around since 1972 and for many, many years was you know, the source of satellite imagery, the, the eye in the sky to observe our globe and is an irreplaceable source of information. But more recently, there have been um, developments in higher resolution satellites, both in terms of spatial resolution. So in other words, the, the size of the pixels that, uh, that are in the pictures, but also the temporal resolution. In other words, how often the pictures are being taken, as well as the spectral resolution. So in other words, not just an RGB image like you have in your in your uh, SLR, but a whole bunch of multispectral um, view of the world. So various bands of infrared, et cetera. And so um, we have, so Planet uh, is a, 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 a company that I um, work with a lot. They have a constellation of CubeSats, which are about uh, the size of a loaf of bread. They've got a few hundred of them orbiting the earth and they acquire a picture of everywhere on earth every single day at three meters resolution. So the desk, you know, my office that I'm sitting in here, which is probably, you know, five by six meters or so would be covered by a couple of pixels. And I could image that, I mean, assuming there wasn't a roof over my head, I could image that, you know, just about every day from space. And, and that's just incredible. And as academics, we get, you know, we get access to these, uh, these, these data sets. There are much, much higher resolution data uh, uh, available as well. I showed some half meter satellite images. There are even, um, finer resolution than that. There are 30 centimeter images from space that that we can just go out and acquire. Uh, you know, we can buy them, um, but they, they're av available commercially. In other words, it's not just a military um, thing. So, you know, we've been able to to see the world like like never before. And that that's just that doesn't even talk about radar or lidar or anything else. It's a really exciting time to be a, a, an Earth surface scientist. It sounds like it. Thank you very much. And so I know that many of you out there must have questions for Dan. Uh, so please type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens. Uh, we appreciate all of your questions, but of course, due to time, we may not be able to answer all of them, but we're going to do our very best here tonight. So the first question that we have here, uh, we have two questions actually from um, Tom Gallagher, one of the Gallagher family who fund this colloquium series. The first one is what does this tell us about the hydroelectric developments uh, in places like the Site C Dam, which I am not particularly familiar with, but perhaps you you are? Yeah, well, good one, Tom. Um, I'm going to punt a little bit because I don't know a lot about Site C. The region that the Site C Dam is in is certainly um, more docile, I guess we could say, in terms of the topography than than the steeper mountains where I where I tend to work. Um, but that's not to say that we can't get landslides into um, into uh, into reservoirs in, in flatter parts of the, the province. I will say that the BC government um, and BC Hydro do a lot of work on geohazards. And so I, I would say, um, you know, I, I don't know much about Site C in particular, but I would say in general, they 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 are probably amongst the best in terms of geohazard safety. Um, for uh, hydropower, but also for pipelines that are going through British Columbia or that potentially go through British Columbia. Thank you very much. And I guess a follow-up on that is about the, the recent Fraser River slide that has stopped salmon from getting upstream. Yeah, so so uh, that's the, the big bar slide on the lower Fraser uh, upstream of Vancouver. Um, and so I, I'm not working on that slide myself, but some colleagues of mine at uh, SFU and UNBC um, and, and other places are. And, and so this landslide came into the Fraser, which is one of, if not the biggest um, salmon rivers in the world and essentially severed the, uh, the migration route. Um, and so there's been a whole lot of work to physically transport salmon above the, above the landslide dam, as well as to remove the dam. Um, I don't know what the latest is, although I did see just the other day that I think if I, if I remember the news story correctly, that more salmon have uh, of whatever species it was, coho or whatever, are making it above the dam than they were anticipating this year. So that was, um, you know, a, a, a sliver of good news in uh, in that one. But, you know, I guess what is, what's important here is, you know, the Fraser River landslide, the Big Bar landslide. <clears throat> um, yeah, it was a pretty, you know, pretty big event in terms of its impact on, on fisheries. Um, 
But you know, when we live in mountain landscapes, we, we sort of assume a level of risk, whether that's from earthquakes or landslides or forest fires or whatever. And so you know, these things are going to happen and, and, and we just need to be doing our best to, um, to anticipate where they might happen, how often, how big, et cetera. Thank you very much. So the next question I think is a, is a quite interesting one. Um, of particular interest to me, Dr. Sugar, is how indigenous ways of knowing have been incorporated into your work in the field in general. Perhaps these events are recorded only in legend, given the rarity, but perhaps it could be an interesting opportunity for collaboration. Yeah, excellent question. Um, so at the at the Butte Inlet uh, landslides on on the um, uh, on the BC coast, there that work is being done, uh, much of it is being facilitated by, by uh, Hakai that I mentioned before, um, who work very closely with coastal um, indigenous groups all up and down the coast. And so the Hamalco First Nation are involved mostly on the fisheries side of things in terms of impacts, um, but they are, are sort of very uh, involved sort of right at the, or were involved right from the beginning in terms of scoping the work that, that's getting done there, being involved in and in, in directing the kinds of work that uh, might get done to answer the questions that they want to, to know. In the Southgate and Elliott Creek itself, something like eight kilometers of salmon habitat for different species was, um, was destroyed or, or, or severely impacted. And so for the Hamalco First Nation, that's obviously, a, uh, you know, something that they want to um, to, to mitigate as much as possible. Uh, on other projects, uh, you know, especially in the Canadian context, um, working with Indigenous people that uh, who, whose traditional territory we're working on is, is incredibly important. So we are, my, my, um, my group and I are working on a glacier in extreme northern BC, almost in Yukon, um, and we're working with the Champagne and Asiac First Nations there to understand um, the, the uh, what may have happened to the river that, that we're working on in the glacier from both a sort of a Western scientific lens, but also through, um, through their oral histories and um, interviews with elders from, from many decades ago, et cetera. And so this is something that I think is traditionally not done very well by, by Western science, but something that many of us are trying to, trying to do um, better going forward. Ah, oh, thanks for that. And so the next question is from one of our colleagues, Dr. Alan Hildebrand. What is the mechanism of the ice melting in the debris flow? Is it the potential energy released, um, which is substantially larger, or what is that? The potential. Yeah. So Alan, the, in um, three three of my colleagues who worked on the Chamoli paper each approached that exact question independently, and all came up with exactly the same answer, which was that the, the fall height of uh, initially 1800 meters and then an additional, I think, 1600 meters along the Rontigad Valley, um, although at a, a lesser gradient, combined with that uh, ratio of rock to ice of 80% to 20% was almost a perfect, um, we could call it worst case scenario in terms of conversion of potential energy to kinetic, kinetic energy to melt almost all of the ice that was in the landslide. So initially, you know, the, 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 uh, the initial sort of guesses that it was a glacial lake outburst flood um, were, were totally not, un, were, were totally reasonable guesses, um, you know, when you see those, see those videos. And so when, when I started to say, oh no, it's actually a landslide, the question became, okay, well, where's all the water coming from? And so we systematically went through all of the different sources of water that were possible and this was the only one. Uh, this was the only one left. And as it turned out, it it produced almost exactly the right, like uh, mathematically produced almost exactly the right amount of water for what we see in, um, in 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 the videos and in the models. Okay. So the next question is from our soon to be dean, Dr. Kristen Bates. It was a wonderful talk, and it has made me wonder what is the role of citizen scientists and or social media in geoscience. Is, is it adding to the knowledge or smaller local events that might not be de detected by other means? Oh, good one. Um, yeah, so social media, I think, has, has really changed the way that hazards are communicated in, in sort of real time or, or near real time. Um, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a story. Um, in the Gorka earthquake, so in 2015, I was working on that, um, and we got 
photos, I guess it wasn't social media, but just maybe the sort of the development of cell phones and that kind of thing. We were getting photos. In fact, the one that I showed of that landslide into the river in the Marciandi Valley, that was a photograph taken by a villager who walked down the valley to see what was going on, took a photo, emailed it to, uh, or texted it to colleagues or friends of his in Kathmandu, and eventually it made its way to, to the group that I was working with at NASA. And um, and and since then, in the last five or six years, you know, social media has has really exploded. And so, um, you know, when when something is happening, something some big event is happening, uh, you know, anywhere around the world, the the hazards community tends to be pretty quick to 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 kind of jump on that and, and try to help to figure out what what is going on. And you know, there's, there's a whole body of research just about social media in disasters and and you know it can be a it can be a hindrance but can also be quite a big quite a big help in in the the cases where i've been involved in um it has been uh you know satisfying i guess you could say to match you know what what we're seeing in in photos and observations from the ground, you know, a couple of hours after something happened to what we see from space or from seismic data or whatever. Um, so yeah, a tough question to answer, but, um, you know, I, I would say playing an increasing role, at least in sort of um, newsy geoscience, I guess, so, you know, geoscience that happens in, in real time, like, uh, like I, I've been doing for the last few years. Uh, next, uh, I'm going to ask a question from Nhayan Rana, I'm sure I'm not saying that right, who is a PhD student at the University of Waterloo. Uh, first question is regarding Butte Inlet uh, RA. It's so surprising and rare to see the distinct sharp separation between the boundary zone or bouldery zone and the finer grained zone. What do you think happened there? Yeah, so Ed, um, excuse me, remarkable how sharp that uh, delineation between that boulder area and that finer silts and sands was. Um, and so RA here, for anybody wondering that, that just means rock avalanche. Um, so yeah, here as the, so when the flow is constrained in Elliott Creek, so constrained in a really tight valley, it's moving very, very rapidly. And then as it spreads out over um, into Southgate down that fan, it, uh, the, the, the flow spreads out, the shear stresses drop, you know, very, very quickly, the, the, the velocities drop very quickly. And then all of that really big bouldery stuff can drop out of suspension um, instantaneously. And so it may be that a hydraulic jump formed. So when you turn on your faucet in your sink and you see the water coming down, um, down out of the, out of the tap and then moves out radially on the floor of the sink and it's really, really smooth. And then you know, five, 10 centimeters away from where, where it's hitting the, the sink, you see it begins to bubble up and, and become much more turbulent. That's a, a hydraulic jump. And so the really, really smooth water is moving extremely quickly. And if we scale that up to something 30, 40 meters deep, would be able to transport huge boulders the size of my office here. But then as soon as the water decelerates, you know, at, at, a, at a, a very um, particular spot, then all of those big boulders can fall out. And so I, I think that may be what's going on. I have not yet mapped some of those modeling results onto the, um, the air photos of the DEMs to look at uh, the LIDAR data to look at if where the modeled drop in velocity occurs is where we see that drop, uh, that the drop out of all those big boulders. Uh, thanks. Like, and they had one nice. more question uh, about the Chamoli. So if Chamoli had not included glacier ice, then how do you think the rock avalanche would have behaved um, the mobility and the energy in particular? Yeah, another good one. Um, so normally rock avalanches have fairly high mobility. So um, they, they tend to travel farther than they would just based on frictional arguments. And so we, what we usually see, like if you think of the Frank, well, you're in Waterloo, so maybe you don't know the Frank slide um, in uh, just a few hours south of us here in Calgary, but um, so you have the steep slope and the, the rock travels down and then deposits in an apron or a fan at the base of the slope. And it might go a few kilometers, but doesn't go 20 kilometers. And so when you have a, a drier rock avalanche, that, that tends to be what happens. It just sort of spreads out, um, maybe quite a distance, but, but that's it. You see a big pile of, of debris at the base of the slope. At Chamoli, we didn't. We saw there was a small pile of debris, about 750,000 cubic meters, which is, you know, sounds like a lot, but it's not that much, um, at the base of the slope. And I almost missed it when I was looking at the imagery the first time, because uh, it's so small relative to the, the size of the mountains. 
Um, but most of it is is much farther downstream, is, is sort of you know almost gone, so to speak, little doing air quotes here. So I think if the ice wasn't there, that's what we would have seen, just a giant pile of sediment um, at the base of the slope, probably quite thick because the, the valley is so constrained there. Great, uh, thank you. We have a couple more questions here. Um, so one question that uh, it was asked about, in particular, would the um, previously inactive areas uh, that we have here in the Rocky Mountains maybe have been impacted by the, the extreme fires of this last season, and would that potentially trigger new, new geomorphic activity? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we do tend to see an increase in shallow landslides. So things like um, shallow debris flows, which we get a lot of on the West Coast anyway, um, due to rainfall in the wintertime, we tend to see a lot more of those after, um, after, uh, after uh, post wildfires. And so here you, you have really just the, the top uh, few deci decimeters, maybe a meter or so of soil and maybe a little bit of till, so the glacial deposits, that then slide after the, the, the fire, all of the, the, you know, the roots are burned up, et cetera. Um, but we, I don't think we tend to see more giant rock avalanches. These, these are um, the, the roots, if you wanna think of them that way, the base of these rock avalanches tends to be much, much deeper, tens of meters into the bedrock rather than just at the, at the surface, which is where the forest fire is really active. Okay, so we have, yeah, just three more questions. I'm going to combine two of them because I think we, they're, they're quite similar. So uh, Joel Paget asks, uh, how often do catastrophic events such as those at Butte and Chamoli occur? Uh, and if an event of a certain magnitude occurs in one location such as Butte, does it indicate that something uh, similar is going to occur similar in the same place? Mm -hmm. And then another uh, attendee asks, um, how can we track the development of cracks like in Chamoli at a regional level? So I guess, what's the predictive predictivity of this, this overall? Yeah, tough one. That was actually, uh, Joel, the, the second half of your question there was actually one of my PhD exam questions. And I, I don't know that I answered it, and I'm, I'm not going to answer it now either. Uh, <laughs> what, um, what I mean by that somewhat cheekily is that, you know, so the question or, or part of the question is whether, you know, when you have a big event, big landslide, does that sort of reset the slope so that you don't have more landslides? Or does that prime the slope for more landslides? And that's a really hard question to answer. In some cases, certainly slopes that have failed, we see repeated big failures. Um, Joran Ekstrom, the seismologist that I mentioned, uh, the paper where he developed that technique of the size of conversions was published in 2013. And one of the uh, case studies that they looked at was on the Siachen Glacier in, in the Karakoram, which had a big pile of debris on it. And they actually found that it wasn't one landslide that had deposited this big pile of debris. It was actually seven landslides over a period of, of uh, a few days or a couple of weeks. And so seven individual events, all essential, but each of which was very large, but all from essentially the same slope. And so, you know, that, that sort of gets to answering part of the second half of your question, but also a little bit about the first part. So, you know, big events, really big events, tend to happen less frequently than small events. If we think of, um, you know, a small rainstorm, we get lots of those, you know, in a, in a given year, but we don't tend to get lots and lots of gigantic um, thunderstorms, you know, like, like truly gigantic thunderstorms. And so landslides, the really, really big ones probably are not that common, although, you know, more common on geological timescales than human, of course, but we're starting to see more and more of them um, you know, with, as time goes on. And so the question arises, okay, is that uh, a climate change signal? Is that a detection signal? Maybe 20 years ago, we just didn't have the means to actually observe these landslides. We didn't have daily satellite imaging. We didn't have people living in, in really remote valleys, et cetera. And the truth is maybe somewhere in the middle. I think in some places like glaciated landscapes, we actually are seeing more landslides um, you know, over over uh, over time, as the glaciers are thinning and debuttressing those slopes, but in other places, it's it's much more complicated. Um, and maybe some of these landslides are actually multiple failures, so which which throws the whole magnitude frequency relationship kind of out the window because we don't actually know what the magnitude is. We don't know how many have occurred. So I, I guess what I'm saying is, it's a really good question that. Um, I don't think we have a good handle on and, and one that many of us in the hazards, geohazards community are, are interested in answering. 
the, the, the kind of part of the question that that Ben added on there about um, tracking, you know, those those cracks. Absolutely. You know, in hindsight, those that that giant crack at Chamoli was was clear as day. You could see it, you know, easily. And if we had known, or if anybody had known to look there, we certainly would, you know, alarm bells would have would have been, you know, dinged. But you know, the problem, and, and so it's it's easy to, to kind of point blame um, or to you know to assign blame with hindsight. But in reality, places like the Himalaya, places like the Rockies, places like the Andes, there are thousands and thousands of very very steep slopes, and so it's it's exceedingly difficult to look at all of them. It's impossible to look at all of them, um, or or I should say. It was impossible. I think nowadays with increased um, data, increased computing power, increased techniques, we're getting to the point where we can actually start to do that. And I think that'll probably be the next really exciting development in geohazards um, kind of mitigation and, and, and disaster risk management. Great. Well, we have one last question here from Tom Gallagher again, and I this is something I actually wanted to ask um, myself. So, like, what is really the geological record of these? Like, can can lake sediment coring, in Tom's example, date some of these large collapse events and give us some sort of future warning and learnings about these? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as geologists, that's really what we're we're trying to do is is look at sediments and rocks and try to understand what happened in the past using you know, events that we observe today as, as analogs. And so in the case of these big landslides, if they leave a deposit behind, assuming we can interpret that deposit appropriately, which is a whole other conversation, then, then certainly we could, we could go around and, and look for giant landslides all over the place. There are some issues with that. Um, lake sediments are, are definitely a, a, a uh, you know, a, a good alternative way of, of doing that. Um, there's lots of work looking at lake cores and, and ocean cores to look at paleo uh, or to study paleo seismology. So in other words, how, um, how many and how big earthquakes have been in the past, including tracking the landslides that have been generated by them. For that to, to work though, you have to have sediment that actually goes into the, into the lake. So um, at Latuya Bay, so that, that giant one, um, in coastal Alaska that was 600 meters high, uh, John Clegg, my PhD advisor at SFU, wanted to go and, and do exactly that, to look at some of the tsunami deposits in some of the lakes. Um, but actually when they tried to land in them, they couldn't because there was still, you know, 50 years later, uh, the lake was still chock full of, of trees from the, from the tsunami itself. So, you know, sort of a double-edged sword. You want just enough sediment to enter the lake to be preserved to build a record that you can then go and, and extract later, but not enough material that makes it impossible to actually get that sediment. So kind of yes, but. All right, thank you all out there for your questions tonight. It's been a great pleasure being with you uh, for tonight's event and being able to participate in uh, Dr. Dan Sugar's Gallagher presentation. I'm going to turn it over to Steve Hubbard, the department head for the Department of Geoscience at the University of Calgary. It's uh, my pleasure to uh, to wrap up uh, tonight's event. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, thank Dan for joining us uh, this evening and agreeing to be our inaugural speaker for this year's uh, uh, Gallagher lecture series. Um, I, I uh, you know, looking back, Gabby, Gabby kind of pointed out uh, what this this uh, Gallagher series means to her. Just the diversity of thought, the, the different ideas, different inspirations um, that 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 she's been able to uh, gather from from being able to attend uh, these wonderful uh, talks, um, probably during her degree here. And I and I think this is just a great example of that that Dan presented to us today. Something that many of us don't think about every day, just due to where we're where we're situated. Uh, but some real neat insight, uh, some real collaboration, and a real inspiration. Uh, I'm sure to, to Gabby and other students as you think about the opportunities down the road. Um, I would like to uh, uh, again take the opportunity uh, to uh, thank the Gallagher family uh, for their ongoing support of this uh, public lecture series and for being real champions of science in our in our community. Um, our students, faculty, and staff, uh, and alumni have all been made richer by being able to learn from world class researchers like Dr. Uh, like Dr. Sugar here today. Um, for others out there, if you're interested in supporting our research or any other faculty initiatives, please do visit our faculty website at science.ucalgary.ca. Um, additionally, we will include the link um, uh, to, uh, for uh, support in our uh, post-event survey that you can follow.
And so before you leave tonight, um, we want to tell you about some upcoming events, lots on the go across the faculty. Um, on September 28th, uh, Dr. Henry, uh, Dr. Ryan Henry in the Department of Computer Science is participating in a, a lunch hour panel discussion entitled The Day the Looney Went Extinct. Um, join us uh, September 29th uh, for the annual Louise and Richard Guy lecture. And this year's presenter is Dr. Ben Green from Oxford, and he'll be discussing unsolved problems in number theory. And uh, rolling back into to geoscience again here, I uh, do plan to attend our next Gallagher colloquium uh, presentation on October 21st. Uh, Dr. Steve Hallam from uh, UBC will talk about co-metabolic innovation along eco-thermodynamic radiance. Uh, I, I, we sure it would be a, an excellent presentation. Look for res registration details uh, in your inbox or by checking our website at science.ucalgary.ca. Uh, lastly, when you uh, do see our event survey uh, in your inbox, please take a moment to fill it out. Uh, the link to give will also be included in the survey in case you are interested in doing so. Your feedback truly is important. Uh, we do want to hear from you as we continue to try to, to arrange to have wonderful speakers that, uh, that speak to, to current events and, and just uh, fascinating ideas. Again, thank you all for coming and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.